Okay, hi everyone. I'm Troy Hunt. I am from Australia, so that might make me in the minority out of the new people. It's the first time I've been here. Um, I live just around the corner, so I keep coming past here, and I thought this was a really good opportunity, not just for security, but because it's really convenient for me, which makes it quite a nice thing. Uh, so I'm a software architect with Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, and I look after how we build software in our emerging markets. And I started getting very involved in security and, and blogging a few years ago when I started to do a lot less development during the day. And it's, it's one of those sort of funny things with your career. Is as it progresses, you, you get to do less of the kind of fun stuff that you actually like. So I went home and started doing it, which is where my blogging came from. And I sort of naturally started leaning towards security. I think I just like that kind of subversive, how do I break things, how do I go against the establishment, if you like, in a very uh, ethical way. <laughs> just want to make that clear, because that's on camera, right? All right, so, so I started doing that, and uh, in particular, started writing this series about OS, because it's, a, it's sort of a good structure to work within that's a, a little bit of an industry standard, which we'll talk about in a moment. And as it then turned out, in April last year, I got uh, an MVP award for developer security. Now, I didn't know there was an MVP award for developer security. I knew there was Word and C Sharp and ASP.NET and all these sort of things. So it, it actually came as a bit of a surprise, and it was a nice surprise. And with any luck, I'll get it again in another couple of months if I've played my cards right throughout the year, which I hope I have. So the deck I wanted to show you guys today, and it, it is a slide deck, I apologize for that. It's not real code, but there's code in there, but we've got to work through a lot of different stuff. Um, it is all real, I can talk to it, which is good. It's not going to be death by PowerPoint, I hope, and it is going to be a little bit fun. I don't want to make it too serious, other than the bits that are meant to scare you so that you go away and take security seriously. So the idea is to talk about protecting your apps from the tyranny of evil with OWASP. And what I wanted to talk about is just a little bit about why we're talking about this, and I think most people have seen a lot of news that makes security a bit of a hot topic at the moment. A little bit about who OWASP is as well, because I think most people don't know who they are. You might have seen the word every now and then, but I just want to touch on it really briefly. And then we'll go through each one of these top 10 web application security risks, try and understand what it is, see it actually get broken, and then fix it in ASP.NET. So, the really interesting bit about why we're talking about this is that every one of these guys has got something unfortunate in common in that they've had some pretty bad breaches of late. <laughs> so I think you'll recognize most of these names. So Gorka was a really big one back in 2010. They had several hundred thousand accounts exposed. Um, Pron.com, you can probably guess what that is. It's probably not the kind of site where you want your personal details to get out there on the web, should you have personal details there. Uh, some of the other big ones, RSA security. So RSA security do secure IDs and little two-factor authentication tokens. That's a pretty serious one to get hacked. Um, someone like Lockheed Martin, you know, these guys make fighter jets, you know, these are not the guys you want hacked. Um, to show how up-to-date this slide is, we've also got Strat4, uh, who was around about Christmas time, so security intelligence. They've had, I think, 860,000 of their accounts put out there online, as well as all their unencrypted credit card details. And even on Monday, we had Zappos. So Zappos, who sells shoes to people in the US, apparently they're looking at about 24 million accounts that have been exposed. Uh, and as yet, we haven't seen passwords and things, so maybe they've protected it well, but it's still, you know, it's 24 million accounts from a really huge retailer. So it's interesting times. So a little bit on OWASP. Um, OWASP, OWASP, depending on who you talk to. Open Web Application Security Project. It is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, the neat thing about OWASP is it is uh, technology agnostic. So we're going to be talking about .NET tonight. And indeed, a lot of the reason I did this series is because I wanted information specifically about .NET, but their objectives apply to PHP or Java or any sort of web uh, application technology that you can think of. So what you'll often find if you're involved in security or if you're a developer and you get feedback from penetration testers or you get feedback from security scans is very often it will refer back to OWASP. OWASP. Christian, which is it? Is it OWASP or OWASP? Uh, I don't think it matters how you pronounce it. Okay. It's, not, I, a, it's not a preferred definition because it was actually founded by two English guys but it's the foundation itself is American based. Okay, so everything is good. Everyone knows what I mean anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so 
they are a frequent sort of reference source. So you're going to see them around a lot. And even if you're not sort of that interested in security, if you get involved with people that do anything security-wise, you're probably going to see it around. So it's a good thing to get used to. So they do a number of different things, but the thing that we're talking about today is this top 10 most critical application security risk. So it is the OWASP top 10. You'll see it around quite a lot on the web. So it comprises of 10 separate individual risks, and it's prioritized by the prevalence. So for example, we'll talk about injection. So injection is what they see as the greatest risk, followed by cross-site scripting, and eventually all the way down to unvalidated redirects and forwards. So we're going to go through each one of these and actually see what it means. And if you have any questions on the way through as well, just yell out. Everyone sounds like they're sort of involved with development. So if you've got sort of specific dev questions, just yell out. OK, so to kick it off, the first one is injection. So most of us will probably think of injection in terms of SQL injection, because we're hopefully building Microsoft technologies and it's got SQL Server behind it. It could be PHP or Oracle or anything like that. But it could also be other languages which are not necessarily database languages. So you could have an LDAP injection. And with injection, we're really talking about the ability to manipulate the queries that are executed against some form of data source normally. Uh, so how can I actually take values that are passed to these queries and turn them into something a bit malicious? Every one of my slides has got an evil guy that we're defeating with these different risks. So a typical example is, let's imagine that we have a web app, and our web app is loading a list of products. And we look at the query string and we say, OK, well, I probably can assume that all of these are category ID 1, and we've got Outback Lager and Sasquatch Isle, etc. If we start manipulating that, whether we do it ourselves or whether we follow other links, we get different results. So obviously, this data which is being passed in via the query string is somehow affecting the results. We can sort of speculate that it's going to be doing something like this. Okay? We're going to be passing a parameter to a statement and getting some results. Now, what happens if we start to manipulate that parameter? So if we think back to that statement, what happens if we terminated that SQL statement with a semicolon, added our own SQL, and then commented out anything after that? In a situation like that, our statement would change more to something like this. So again, as a sort of thinking remotely and we don't know what's inside, we can kind of speculate that this is probably what's going to happen. If the app is vulnerable to SQL injection, after we run that, and remember, we're just running that page, but then it's taking that data and passing it to the database, we can manipulate the contents of the database like so. So this would be a typical SQL injection attack. So what's happening in the background is probably pretty obvious. So we're getting a category ID out of the query string, and it's concatenating it to a string. Now, obviously, the risk here is that it's just taken that ID, it's whacked it into the query, and it's ended up with one string and said, go to SQL Server and just execute it. So this is probably pretty familiar sort of stuff. So there's a few different things we want to do to mitigate the risk of injection. And one of them in this case is whitelist validation. So we want to make sure that any untrusted data is validated. So when we say untrusted data, we mean anything that is coming externally into the application. So it could be query string, could be a form value, could be a request header. It could be you're uploading an MP3 file and it's got an ID3 tag. All of these things are untrusted in that we can't, we can't be confident of the legitimacy of the source or, or the intent of the source. So for something like a category ID, it's got to be an integer. In this case, we expect it to be a number. The whitelist validation is saying, look, if it's not a number, let's get out of here. We don't need to necessarily cast it to a number in order to work with that particular statement, but we should expect that that's what it is. So the other big thing with SQL injection is to parameterize our statements. So we can parameterize in a few different ways. We can still use inline SQL and pass that ID as an actual parameter attribute of your SQL command. So that's one way. And if we try and do this, obviously, it's also going to need to cast it to an integer. So if anyone passes anything that isn't an integer, things are going to stop working. The other thing we can do is we can use good old stored procedures. So when we execute stored procedures, we do pass these parameters, again, as parameter attributes of the objects. So they should actually be validated, first of all, for their data type. And it will actually ensure that you can't just concatenate a string, at least when the stored procedure is called. Now, you could pass a string to a stored procedure, and it may be that your stored procedure then goes through concatenating a string and then executes it. So 
stored procedures are not immune, but they do take a good step forward. The other thing is, is that most ORMs will do the parameterization for you. So if you're using Entity Framework, Link to SQL, NHibernate, any of those guys, you don't need to worry too much about the risk of injection. You should still be using whitelists and that sort of thing and validating your input, but you don't need to worry too much about the parameterization side of things. And the final thing is, and this is a little bit sort of tangential, is applying the, uh, the principle of least privilege, which basically says what's the least amount of rights that we need to be able to get our job done. So in the case where we have got a public user connecting to a web application which then goes to a database, we might say let's have one account that all our public users use and let's make sure that that account uh, only has select uh, access over our products. So we don't want public users by some sort of little glitch in our app having the ability to update what's in a product. Read from it, that's great, not update. So it might mean that you end up having multiple connection strings. So you have a connection string that your administrators use where they can actually update content. It's a different connection string that's used by your public users. Before I go on to the next slide, and it's the next topic, I might just stop briefly at the end of these and see if anyone's got any questions or comments. Yeah, so whitelist says these are all the things that we do like. Blacklist says that these are all the things that we don't like. So the reason why a whitelist would be preferable is that a whitelist is very explicit. So a whitelist says this is exactly what we need for our application, this is what we trust. The risk with blacklists is that if, say, another attack vector using different characters or different strings is discovered after you create your blacklist, then you've got the risk of that later being exploited. So whitelist is a, is a little bit more stringent. Okay, so cross-site scripting. Again, I think this one, at least terminology-wise, is going to be pretty familiar. So think of cross-site scripting as a way of, of breaking out of a, of a data or value context in HTML and entering some form of a code context. So closing off tags and starting to actually get the page to do different things to what it was designed to do is a pretty good example there. Now, cross-site scripting can do a lot of different malicious things. So a lot of people think of cross-site scripting, well, you know, I can put an alert box on somebody's page. But it can get a lot worse than that, and there have been some pretty significant incidents. MySpace had a really big one a few years ago. So a typical sort of S XSS attack, and this is what we'll refer to as a reflective cross-site scripting attack, is somebody engineers you into following a link. So maybe they send you an email, maybe they put it on Twitter, maybe they use a link shortener, so it's a little t.co or something like that but they entice you into clicking on a link. Um, okay, in, in this particular example, I've got this the wrong way around. This is just a simple unsubscribe. So in an unsubscribe like this, we've got my email address which appears in the query string, and then we've got that data repeated in the page. So we could sort of guess that, okay, we're gonna take this query string and the application is then just writing it back to the page. Where it gets a little bit interesting is what happens when we start to manipulate this value. And this is where that engineering piece earlier on came into play. So if someone was to follow a link that had a script tag in it and an alert, they're going to get an alert on the page. This is the one that you often see people use in order to demonstrate that you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. This doesn't matter too much. When we get through to something like this, this is when we start to have a problem. So when an attacker has the ability via, say, something like a query string to change the way the page is behaving, it opens up other problems. So in a case like this, it's saying, hey, you know, give me your password. Now we look at this and it's a domain that we trust, it's a site that we trust, we can still see the rest of the site here. It's asking me to do something, so it must be trustworthy. What's happening in that parameter is it's saying, okay, give a prompt, give a password, uh, now go and send that information over to my domain, give me the password and give me all your cookies while we're there. So your cookies could have authentication tokens and things like that. So this is reflective in that it's taking something, say, in the query string and it's representing it back to the page. The risk here is going back to that social engineering point, if I can get that URL and I can get someone to click on it and get them to go through this process, I prompt them into it, I entice them into it, that's when we have a bit of a problem. 
So a lot of people sort of go, oh, yeah, but you've got, to, you know, you've got to construct this URL just the right way before it's a problem. But there are ways of getting people to, to, to fall for that trap. The other form of XSS, which I don't cover here, is persistent cross-site scripting. So what happens if someone manages to get cross-site scripting into the database? So maybe it's a, a SQL injection vulnerability, but they manage to get strings like this stored in the database so that when that page loads, it happens automatically. You don't need to engineer them into following a particular sort of query string. So that sort of vulnerability pops up a lot on forums where people have signatures and avatars and things like that, and they can kind of edit their own HTML. Obviously, once you follow that link, well, then we go off to somewhere else. And in this case, the query string's got my password, and it's got all of my cookies in it as well. Um, again, once you can start to actually modify the page contents, you can do just about anything. Load external CSS, load external JavaScript, change what the page says. You can get pretty creative. So this is what was happening before. Uh, and it's extremely simple. Obviously, this is a web forms app. I've got an email label and I'm just taking that string and I'm just going, here you go, it's on the page. So whatever ends up in that query string variable ends up on the page. So the first thing that we want to try and not do is disable request validation. So .NET has got request validation built in, which means if you try and send malicious content via the request object or via the form object, it's going to say, hang on a moment, you're not really meant to do this, and it will hopefully throw an error. If you turn it off, you do start to become vulnerable. There are times when you need to turn it off, like you might have an HTML editor on the page, and that has to post HTML, but you can turn it off on the page level. You don't have to disable the entire site. The next thing, again, is about whitelists. So we covered whitelists in the last um, section on injection. We can also apply whitelists to XSS. So the logical thing to do in that case would have been to say, look, we only expect an email address. It's easy to create a regex for an email address. If it's not an email address, let's just get out of here and not actually process things any further. And output encoding is the other big one. So the problem before was that it took that string and it literally put that in the page. So we ended up with angle brackets in the source code of the HTML. Output encoding will escape all of that. So it'll take your angle brackets and it will turn them into ampersand less thans and ampersand greater thans, and it will actually render them to the page rather than execute them in the code. Now the important thing also with output encoding is you've got to output encode to the correct context. So the way that you would encode something in HTML is different to the way you would encode in CSS or in JavaScript. So something like the anti-XSS library has really good encoders for all these different languages, makes it really easy to say, that encode this for JavaScript because I'm going to put it in a variable that will execute on the client, and then encode this for HTML. Any questions on XSS? All right. Is this new to most people, or is it pretty familiar? Or indifferent? <laughs> Show of hands, is there anything new in this for anybody? Yeah, yeah about half? Okay. All right. Well, we'll... Yeah, sure. Do you recommend saving into the database as encode? No. So you're, you're going to encode, so you're going to encode from the database to the database? Yeah, because the problem is, is that if you encode into the database, you're making the assumption that every context in which that data will be displayed is going to be the context that you encoded for. So if you encode into the database and then you want to pump it out into XAML, you're going to have a problem, or you want to pump it out into JavaScript or return it in JSON or something, it's going to get tricky. So good whitelist validation before it goes into the database uh, and always uh, output encoding when it comes out of the database. That's one good thing about MVC as well. It will output encode everything unless you're using the raw HTML helper. Broken authentication session management is one of a couple of kind of generic ones in OS top 10. So they kind of go, well, it could be related to authentication session management, could be related to frameworks. It's kind of a bit of this, a bit of that. So I've made a sort of specific interpretation in terms of the relevance to ASP.NET. So an example of how we might have broken authentication session management is we log on to a typical web page. And in this case, this page is persisting the session via the query string. So obviously, HTTP is a stateless protocol. There's got to be some way of persisting who you are between requests. And normally, it would do that by cookies. ASP.NET can be configured to do that via the query string. 
and particularly if your device doesn't support cookies, it will do it via the query string. So what this means is that we're logged on and I've got this great big URL which has my session in it. Now the problem with this is that if we then jump over to another browser, so I'm over in Safari now, and we plug that URL in, we're still authenticated. So you can actually sort of pass that authenticated session across between users. Now this is a bit risky because if your user very innocently says, uh, you know, hey look, I want to send a link on Twitter or I want to send it to my, my mum or my brother or something and they send this link over, then they basically take over that authenticated session. So now you've got two people that are sharing the same session. Obviously bad things can happen from this. So there's a few different ways that we can mitigate this particular problem and similar problems in ASP.NET. Um, so this is the way it was working just before. So within forms authentication, there is an attribute called cookieless. When you use URI, it does that great big query string which persists everything in the address bar. What we want to try and do is, at a minimum, use device profile. So if we use device profile, it will try and default to cookies. If your device supports cookies, and pretty much everything does, unless you've disabled it, it'll put it in a cookie. You can also change that to only use cookies, so it will never put it in the URL. So if you feel confident enough that everybody using your web app is only ever going to have cookies enabled, you can actually lock it down a little bit more. It's the same sort of thing for session state. So session state will actually default to using cookies. But you can change session state so that it will use device profiles. So the risk is, is that you can still persist session state as well as authentication via the URL, which means it's easy to get hijacked again because you send the link to somebody else. So other things we can do to mitigate the risk of broken authentication is reduce uh, timeouts. Now, this is sort of one of these areas where, okay, we can be more secure, but then we're going to drive everybody nuts because we're making life harder for them. If we reduce that window of an active session, we kind of reduce the risk of when someone can attack us. So in the example before, that URL would only be available or valid for 10 minutes after it was last requested, and then it would expire. It's better than the default 20 minutes because you have it, but then somebody goes away and they get a cup of tea and they come back and they're logged out and they've got to log in again and they abuse you because you make life hard on them. So it's, a, it's sort of a balanced thing. And it's the same thing with sliding expiration. So sliding expiration means that when sliding expiration is on, every time you make a request, that 10 minute or 20 minute session expiration restarts. When sliding expiration is off, you log in and then you've got bang, 10 or 20, whatever you set it at, before the whole thing expires and then you've got to log on again no matter what you're doing. So, Sliding expiration has got a usability impact because anyone uses it for more than your session timeout and they're going to have to log in again. But then again, on the security side of things, it reduces that window. So it's, it's a balanced thing. I can't tell you what, what's right. It's whatever you know, suits your scenario. OK, so insecure direct object references. Uh, so the idea here is that an insecure direct object reference is when we take something like an internal entity, which might be, say, a database record, and we expose a reference to that externally. So let's say we take the key of that database record and we put it in the URL. So an example of this, uh, we had Citibank. Must have been about mid last year. So Citibank, someone found they could log on to Citibank and they saw their account number in the URL. And they said, well, Ian, I wonder if I up that one and I change one of the numbers, will I see somebody else's account? And sure enough, they did. So they could actually reference, I mean, I mean it sounds like there's a bank, right? <laughs> but but it, it, it happens. And it, it kind of makes you think as well, when you see all of those logos earlier on, sometimes it's something really, really simple like this. <clears throat> okay, so that was obviously due to a number of different problems, but the underlying issue was because they knew what that internal entity might be, and the key was a kind of natural key, it was something that they could either increment or it was something that made sense logically and they could change it to something else that made sense, they had a problem. So an example of what that might look like is, let's imagine that uh, we're logged onto an application and I've got a link here to edit my account details. And as we can see from the status bar, it's going to pass uh, my username uh, to that next page. So when we go to that next page, we can see that, okay, my username is in the query string and my details have been loaded in the page. 
So far, so good, although it looks a little bit odd. Where it goes wrong is what happens if we start to manipulate that. And this is what the guy did with Citibank, right? He said, look, let's just change it and then we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, and a similar thing happened with First State Super here in Australia. It was only a few months ago. It was all over the news. A guy just went, well, I can see my mate's um, super statement if I increment it by one. Let's write a script and we'll increment it by, like, by one just a hundred times over. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he got into trouble. So that would be a, another example of an indirect uh, object reference or direct object reference. So obviously the problem here is that we've loaded John's details, we're logged in as me, this is not the way software is meant to work. So what's happening here is there's sort of a, a bit of a vain attempt at security, so let's make sure that this identity is authenticated. Okay, they're authenticated, therefore it must be okay to do whatever they're going to do. Um, obviously the problem here is it's just taken that username and then it's served up the records. I often see this happen as well, particularly when people say, well, it's, it's say, an internal application. Everyone internal we trust, right? Everyone's cool internal. Uh, so long as you're authenticated and you're on our network, then everything must be okay. That's not quite right. So the really obvious thing here is access controls. So there were not access controls in place to ensure that one user could not load another user's profile. So a really simple thing here would be say, well, look, you know, you can only load your own profile. I mean, this is, this sounds obvious. It gets missed a lot. Now, the other thing, and apologies for bulk of uh, <laughs> copy-paste code, and there's another one coming at the moment as well, is to use an indirect reference map. And the idea of an indirect reference map is let's have some sort of abstraction between our internal keys and our entities and what we expose externally. So what might happen in an in, in a indirect reference map is we'll say, for somebody's session, let's take that internal key and let's map it to something else arbitrary. So I'm going to use a GUID in a moment, but we could use preferably a cryptographically random string and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're only ever going to expose this indirect reference, and then every time they make a request for it, somewhere in memory in our session, we're going to translate that to the actual underlying record. Now the advantage of that is that so long as it's a random ID, you can't go through and say increment it by one or put in another person's name. What it means is, is that whenever your application is talking to the database, you're continually converting backwards and forwards between this indirect reference map. You're taking an indirect reference, converting it to a direct reference, and then when you're returning information to the page, you're taking a direct reference and converting it to indirect reference. I think I got all that right. <laughs> now this is not something you probably want to do on every app because quite frankly, it'll drive you nuts. Um, if you're Citibank, it's probably not a bad idea if you're dealing with people's money. If you're pulling products out of the database or doing some basic things and you've got the proper access controls, which is really the underlying issue, I probably wouldn't be too stressed about it. Okay, cross-site cross request forgery. So this one's a little bit interesting and I think it's one that often is not so well understood. Now, the, the trick with cross-site request forgery is somebody is already authenticated to an application and an attacker is going to trick them into doing something with that application that takes advantage of the fact that they're already authenticated, but they don't know what this attacker is going to have to do to them. So what might happen in a typical sort of CSRF scenario, and this app here is just a, you know, this is a social app, so everybody's updating their status, social media app. Um, you plug in a piece of text, you update your status, and you get something new. So you get an email like this, and this, you know, this sounds pretty good. <laughs> so you go, okay, I want to click on this link uh, and see what's going to happen. Now, I'm already authenticated to my other app. So particularly applications like, say, Gmail, Hotmail, things where you have very long-running authenticated sessions where you keep coming back to them are particularly at risk of CSRS. So again, it takes advantage of the fact that you are actually authenticated to the site we're going to attack. So I follow that link, and we get a page like this. We're over on an evil site, and all we know is, you know, there's probably a little bit more subtle normally, but in this instance, you've been CSRF'd. If we go back to here, oh man, I should have chosen different text for SSW. Um, if we go back to here, there is a statement which I probably wouldn't normally make on my social media. Uh, so this has somehow been automatically put into my application by the attacking site, and SharePoint is awesome, don't worry about that. Uh, okay, so what's happening underneath here? 
is we used a little uh, WCF to post this status and what our method here is doing is it's saying okay well give me the status that you want to post and make sure we're logged on. So this is an entirely reasonable thing to do if this identity is not logged on throw some sort of exception, handle it gracefully that whatever you do don't let them update your status. Nothing really wrong with this per se and it's a very common way of writing apps. Now the other thing that happens is obviously you've got a client side that's making a request to this service and I think particularly in things like Ajax services where they're kind of a little bit out of sight, out of mind, it's easy for this to happen. But our attacker script looks like this. So what it's done is it simply included any other external resources we had to scripts where there might be a dependency and then it's made a, a request. So it's, it's just simply posted that back to the service. Now the problem is, and again this there's a lot of it depends on this, but depends on the browser and what sort of native security defenses it's got and browsers are getting better and they're restricting cross-origin requests and things like that. But certainly there are many browsers where you can still go through and say, okay, I want to force this person to make a request to another site. I'm already authenticated, so when I make that request, it's going to send my authentication token, it's going to send anything else that's in my cookies, so it looks like a legitimate request. So one way of dealing with this is to use the synchronizer token pattern. And the idea is this kind of failed and it was kind of vulnerable because it was a pretty predictable pattern. So we posted to a particular URL, uh, the method signature was this, we posted a bit of text and everything worked. The idea of the synchronizer token is to say, well look, let's, let's put a bit of randomness into this process. So what this token is going to do in this case, is it's going to create a GUID. So again, we're better off probably having a cryptographically random string because GUIDs are a bit predictable, but they're also pretty random as well. So what's happening here is we're getting a token that is set in the page, which is saying when you make a request for this resource, when you do a, a post to this uh, particular method, get, send this token, and it's also setting in the cookie. Okay, so we're getting this same token coming from two different channels. When the page now executes, and when that contract executes, it's going to make sure that your cookie matches what's been sent to the method. So this is a way of saying, hey, look, if you don't have that set, okay, if you don't have this piece of information that only the web server knows about, this attacker site doesn't know about, you know, they know where we're going to post to, they know the method and they know the update text, and your cookie will go automatically with it, but if they're not passing this other little piece of random data that's in the page, it's not going to work. Now this is also an MVC, and MVC makes it really easy for you because they've just got an anti-forgery token. So you have a little HTML helper that puts your token in, and then you have a little uh, attribute here you can decorate your method with, which says validate the anti-forgery token, and that's it. And it sort of encapsulates all of those three windows and lines of code into one neat little uh, request. Does this make sense? <laughs> Yeah, it'd be a nonce. So it'd be a, a number used once. So it'd be something totally random, belongs to this person, you wouldn't use it again. Okay, so this is really the second kind of broad, generic, you know, it's a bit of an umbrella sort of thing. And security misconfiguration, again, just by reading this, it can kind of be construed a few different ways. You know, your framework's up to date, you know, so on and so forth. So. I'll give you a specific example in ASP.NET where I think this is broken. In fact, I'll give you a few specific examples and then talk about some mitigations. So an example of security misconfiguration, and most of you have probably seen this in one capacity or another, is when custom errors are turned off. Uh, so your custom errors are not off, an internal server error happens and you get yellow screen of death, sometimes you get stack trace, you start to get disclosure about what's happening internally within the app. And in a case like this, that disclosure might include something sensitive. So, okay, if we have that ID, then we're an admin. You could start to kind of draw some conclusions from that. Another case of security misconfiguration would be having uh, tracing available. Uh, so if you said, okay, well, look, I just want to turn on tracing for a while. I just want to, you know, see if everything's okay. And then you kind of forgot about it. And this happens a lot. It happens a lot with custom errors as well. Uh, you could potentially be exposing anything that you 
trace dot wrote or trace dot warned out. Um, plus, of course, you get a whole control tree down there. So you get a lot of information, you get a bunch of server variables. If tracing is off on your production app, you're disclosing some potentially damaging info. And another problem, and we touched on this earlier before, this page looks okay, but for an ASP.NET app, it's really not okay because we have passed in a piece of content that should have been caught by request validation. So request validation in a web forms app should have caught that and thrown an error and handled it um, gracefully. So there's a little trick that when you can go to any ASP.NET web app, put script after the, after the URL, and if it doesn't throw an error, then they've turned it off. So a bunch of different things you can do. Uh, obviously, making sure that you're not debugging. And again, all of this is production stuff, right? So in your dev environment, you're not going to have all this enabled because you want that verbosity and you want that information. In production, you definitely don't. Request validation, we know. Custom errors, we know. Um, one trick with this as well, where'd that go? I'm going to have to start pressing buttons because this just died. Um, so one trick with your web.config is try and use, uh, uh, I think this is Cactus. Sorry, mate? No, actually, it's just not responding. Oops. Right. Let me just try and fire that up again. Sorry, guys. All right, I'm going to put that down, and <laughs> we'll see how this goes. So one thing you can do with your web.config is try and use config transforms. So I don't know how many people use those config transforms we got with uh, VS 2010. It's part of MS Build as well. Uh, Hanselman's got a great post that uh, says uh, you've been deploying it wrong. You should be using config transforms. Because what they do is they allow you to say, look, for each of my different build configurations, I want to change my web.config. So I want a different connection string because I need a test database instead of a dev database. Uh, and I want to set all these guys. If you get that right, it really minimizes that risk of doing a deployment and having, say, custom errors turned off. Because otherwise, people are sort of X-copying or Control-C, Control-V into their target environment, and then they're hand-editing the config file when they remember to. And sooner or later, you screw something up. It's just inevitable. Uh, so the other thing is uh, encrypting your web.config sensitive bits. So things like connection strings are really, really dead easy to encrypt in your web.config. This is particularly important before you, say, put it into source control. So if you put config files into source control and you've got production database strings and your new developer comes in, and you basically he's kind of got everything he needs to get into a production database. So it's very, very easy uh, to encrypt that just with an ASP.NET reg IIS command and suddenly it all turns into indecipherable stuff that only makes sense when it's actually run in the target environment. Uh, another one is NuGet. Who uses NuGet? If you're building ASP.NET and you don't, start using it because it's awesome. Uh, so NuGet is a really, really easy way of packaging external libraries, uh, and it's also a really easy way of keeping them up to date. So in terms of security misconfiguration, NuGet helps you mitigate the risk of frameworks that are out of date. Uh, so the reason why this is valid from a security context, if we take something like anti-XSS, last week anti-XSS had an important update because there was a risk in some of the encoding of some information leakage. With NuGet, you go into your app, you fire this up, you go to updates, you say, give me that, and it's all done. So you're not sort of searching around for assemblies and then modifying config files and things. It just makes it really, really easy. Uh, now, another really good one is WCSA, or the Web.Config Analyzer. Has anyone used this? One guy. <laughs> this is really great. So WCAnalyzer.com. Uh, you upload your web.config file to there. You probably want to remove the sensitive bits first, just, you know, suggestion. And it goes through and it does about 30 different checks on security-related information in your web.config. So the basic stuff like custom errors, but then uh, MAC address encryption, and are you only using SSL for forms authentication? Uh, so it comes back, gives you a lot of good info. And there's also a little executable you can put in your CI server and automatically run this on deployments and things. So it's a good way of sort of uh, getting a bit of a head start on what might be wrong with your configuration. OK, so this is where it starts to get really interesting and where it might be a little bit newer to some people. Uh, insecure cryptographic storage. So this is not so much about 
did you have cryptographic storage or did you not? It's do you have it and have you done it right? So this appears to be the problem with Stratfor the other day, where they've had cryptographic storage, and I'm sure the devs could go to the CIO or whoever and say, well, yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's all in, it's, it, it's, it's stored cryptographically because we hashed it with MD5, so everything's fine. Um, <laughs> the problem is we've got 860,000 accounts floating around, and about half of them have had the passwords very, very easily resolved. And let's have a look at how that might happen. So let's take an example, and you, you've got to kind of have a bit of a stretch in the imagination in this example, but we sign up to a web app, all the usual information, it looks fine. As an end user, you really don't know what's going on in the back end. I mean, we're devs, we know that we can put up a very pretty front and then the back can be crap or whatever it may be. So you trust this site, and then before you know it, you get an email like this. Uh, and this is one that did come to me. So Trapster uh, is one of the guys that got, um, that got owned. They do a little iPhone app that tells you when there's uh, speed cameras and things in case you worry about that. Um, but their database got disclosed, same way as you know, the Stratfors and the Gawkers of the world, all their accounts got released. Um, so as far as I knew, my password was now out there. Now the problem is a, a really common way of dealing with, and I won't say encrypted because there's a difference here, but dealing with hashed passwords is to use what we call a rainbow table. So the idea of a rainbow table is actually, is everyone familiar with what hashing is? Or should I touch quickly on hashing? Got about half, half people half nodded. <laughs> so very briefly, uh, a hash is a, a deterministic algorithm which says uh, take a string, uh, use this algorithm to convert it into another string. Every time we apply that same algorithm to the same source string, we'll get the same result. It's deterministic. Um, so if we use a hashing algorithm like, say, MD5, every single time I create my password, I put my password in, it always hashes to the same value. So what it means is, because a hash is a one-way algorithm, so you can't take the hash string and then reverse it, it's just, it just only goes that way, the only way we can actually validate someone logging on is we have to rehash the password they enter when they log on and compare it to the one in storage. And if they match, you log on. Now the problem with this, because it is deterministic, once you actually know the text value of a hash, you can reapply that. And in fact, what you'll find is if you hash any sort of common word and you Google it, you will find that there's a Google index of the hash and the plain text. So Google is just this awesome sort of hash cracking engine. And it's simply because all these guys have broken through websites and then they're going, here you go, here's a million hashes and, and the passwords. Um, <laughs> getting back to what a rainbow table is, and this is a little free app called Rainbow Crack, a rainbow table goes through and it does this on mass. So what it does is it says, Let's take uh, every string between, say, six and nine characters, uh, lowercase letters only, which covers about half of the passwords most people use, and let's just generate all of these hashes, and we'll just generate millions and millions and millions of hashes, and then our, this will be our rainbow table. So you then come along with your password crack, and you've got you know, 50,000 hashes. You put that into the rainbow table, and it goes through really, really efficiently, and it spits out something like this. So it says, here was your hash on the left, this is what the plain text is. And that's it, it's game over. That's inevitably what happened uh, to Stratfor the other day. So, protecting against that. This is what was happening. So this is just a very standard way of creating an MD5 hash. Okay, very, very straightforward. So this means that we put plain text password in, it's always gonna produce the same hash. So there's a couple of things we wanna do and the first thing we want to do is use what we call a salt. And the idea of a salt is it's a piece of randomness so that the hashes are vulnerable because they're predictable, because every time we hash this string we always get the same result, there's a vulnerability in that. So the idea of a salt is it's a cryptographically random string. And what we're going to do then is we're going to take that salt, we're going to add it to the password, and then we're going to hash the whole thing together. So what that means is even though you have the same password, if you have 10 people in the system, they all have the same password, but you've got a different salt for every one, you're going to get a different end result. So what ends up happening in the database is you've got all the usual sort of ID and email stuff, you've got your hashed password and you've got your salt. So when someone logs in, the process is simply repeated. So I log in with my email address and my plain text password, it goes to the database, it gets the salt, it adds that to my plain text, it hashes it and then it compares it to the password hash. 
The other thing is, though, there is a risk around the algorithms that are used. So MD5 is considered quote unquote broken. So it's an old algorithm. These days, the recommendation is go with a, a higher variant of SHA or go with something like bcrypt, which is adaptive and it's meant to be much slower for automation, but not so slow that it makes it difficult when people log on. Interestingly, if you use, next bit, if you use the ASP.NET membership provider, it uses SHA-1. So many people say, yeah, you know, SHA-1's too old, it's broken, you should use bcrypt or something like that. But, and I don't know if, if anyone else, maybe Christian's got a view on this as well, but I don't seem to see websites being breached that had any form of algorithm, even MD5, and cryptographically random salts and getting accounts exposed en masse. I'm sure that the bar is a lot higher once you use high variants of SHA or particularly bcrypt. But even if it's SHA-1 and it's the default membership provider, I don't know, Christian, if you've got a view on that, but it just doesn't seem well, to be. You can still use MD5. It depends on what you want to use it for. If you want to use MD5 to authenticate like a signature, you can get collisions. Mm. Um, so you can use collisions. A lot of web services still use MD5, um, mainly for just reducing the hash value and because it's the most popular implementation that's out there at the moment. Um, don't use SHA-380. Right. Um, there is the new NIST running a new hashing, a secure hashing scheme competition, which is the same one with the Kuwait AES, which is they take a whole ton of candidates and then the other people who submitted their papers evaluate the other solutions and then they best eventually want to be Right, right. So the, uh, the interesting thing there as well with hash collisions, so it is possible, and this sort of goes back to that hashdos discussion before, to have two separate strings and they both hash to the same value because your, let's say an MD5 hash is only so long, uh, inevitably there are input strings, plain text strings that will hash to the same value. So I think to, to your point, Christian, if you're dealing with something where you need to have absolute uniqueness, particularly MD5 or the lower variants of SHA are going to be much more vulnerable to a hash collision. Well, right? You wouldn't use it for like generating X5 and all certificates, which is what yeah. to run for SSL. Because then what happened is they just noted that collisions um, that were signed by the provider, and then Jacob Abelbaum and Alex Shulosky and all that yeah. were issuing certificates as rapid SSL. Um, and of course, they were told to move out of MD5 to. Um, yeah. And it was one of those things that's going to be done next week, kind of thing. Yeah, right. Um, so it depends on what you want to, or what your intent is. If you're going to use it for security applications, don't use it for the yeah. um, But if you're just using it as for lookup or something like that, then it might be I think with, uh, with ASP.NET, because we have the option of going to SHA and going to higher SHA variants, it's, it's kind of an easy thing. I mean, I don't think you'd, you'd kind of go out, at least not for the storage of passwords, you know, you wouldn't kind of go out from day one and go, okay, I'm going to MD5 everything. Um, so in terms of ASP.NET, if you do use the membership provider, and this is just the little setup process that it goes through, you'll get SHA-1. Uh, you can always go through and Sorry, as I said back there, go and get uh, a third-party bcrypt library so you can add bcrypt if you want to to your ASP.NET apps. That's the other thing too, is don't try and roll your own. Yeah. Um, I actually did that with the Linux Mint Library because I Mm, mm. I think that's, that's a really good point, and I know that we can probably apply that to a bunch of different things. People don't like to use what's out there. They go, yeah, you know, I can do my own. I can do it a little bit better. Um, so that, it, you know, to, to me at least, I, I would never, I wouldn't know where to start if I was going to write my own hashing algorithm. Uh, but, but particularly, even things like the ASP.NET membership provider. Does everyone know what that is? Yes. Some some people do. Um, so that the membership provider. 
is a mechanism within ASP.NET which allows you to do things uh, like uh, register, login, password reminders. It does all the persistent storage of these things. If you start a new ASP.NET web application and you don't have an empty one, you just have a, a new one, all the same with an MVC3 app, you know you get all those pages. In fact, all my examples have sort of had a, a login or a register link. Um, if you run up the, and I forget the command now, but it's in the, the notes I'll give everyone later. I think it's ASP.NET underscore reg sequel. If you run that from the VS uh, command prompt, it gives you this little wizard, and you can go through and say, this is my database, and it just automatically creates gazillions of stored procedures. You get all these database tables, you get um, you know, your, your salt stored, you get your hashed password. Everything is just done automatically. So it means that literally within the space of five minutes, you can go from nothing to an app that's pretty well built with a proper back end and, and nice and secure. So I, I think in that sort of don't roll your own theme, try and use that because Microsoft has done a pretty good job of it. You know, it's pretty stable. There are a couple of little things that some people don't like, but unless you've got a really good reason, I, I probably wouldn't be pulling it apart and, and doing my own. So it gets fancy. <laughs> um, I, I think the TLDR out of all of that is try and use whatever has already been built for you and has proven to be good. Well, there's key cards at mine, which is published by Google, which is a Java and a client implementation, and that actually has, it sits above the crypto API and only gives you the interfaces for the, the algorithms. Right, that right. And it gives you the functions so you just don't stuff it up. So yeah. I always swim. Right, right. It's now being reviewed by the NSA, but it has that thing that because it's, I believe the results have been published, but people still question it. Right. Don't roll your own. <laughs> um, and if you don't know about the ASP uh, membership provider and you want to see it, there's a little five minute uh, screencast on my blog where it goes from nothing to the whole thing up and running and all working in less than five minutes. It's really that easy. Failure to restrict URL access. It, you can pretty much tell what that is <laughs> by the name. Uh, making sure that resources that are only meant to be available to some people are actually only available to those people. So a very sort of typical example of where that might happen is, and I have seen this one many times actually, so it's, it's a very realistic one. Um, at the moment we've got a home link and we've got an about link, but we haven't logged in. And then once we log in, well suddenly we get other facilities. So let's say we get an admin facility. And we head on over to the admin page and we get to do admin-y sort of things. Uh, so from the surface of it and from the casual end user, well, okay, this is great. I couldn't get to the admin page unless I logged in. The problem is, is that if we log out, we still got the admin page. So the entire security for this was actually around the navigation. This sounds weird, but it happens. I've seen it. <laughs> so um, that would be a failure to restrict URL access because the actual admin URL has not been restricted. So a really sort of simple example of how that might happen is in this instance someone's saying, look, if it's, uh, if it's me, if it's Troy Hunt, give us the admin link. Uh, and then on the admin page there is no sort of validation about are you actually Troy Hunt. So the easy way to fix this is obviously to make sure that there's some sort of sanity check. So are you actually authorised to access this page? Um, don't do it quite like that because you really don't want to be putting this stuff in code. Go and use things like location and authorization in your web.config because that ties back into the membership provider. And it's very, very easy to then uh, say in a simple configuration file, this is who gets access to what. Um, now, don't do it quite like that either. Try and use roles. So try and get away from the concept of saying this individual can do that and that individual can do that because it gets really messy. It's really difficult to manage. Uh, so using roles is a good idea and part of this whole membership provider model is that there is a role provider model. So you do have the concept built into ASP.NET where you can create roles and then those roles can be used in places like this. The other thing you can do is use principal permissions. 
So again, this might be one of those ones which some of you haven't seen before, but you can decorate uh, a class or a method with the principal permission. And what this means is that regardless of what we declare in our configuration, when this code executes, it will actually check that permission. So if, for example, you've got a class that does all your administration, for example, you might want to decorate that with the principal permission, and then you've got absolute certainty encapsulated within that class that it's only going to be the admin role that actually gets access to do things like delete users. So it's this extra sort of little layer of security. So this is another one that gets really interesting, and I think most people feel like they have a bit of an idea of it, and you probably do, but there's normally a couple of other twists with it as well. And when we talk about insufficient transport layer encryption, we're not talking about do you have SSL or TLS or HTTPS or not, it's have you implemented it uh, in the proper fashion. So a really good example of this is we had a scenario recently with Facebook. And when you look at Facebook, it's not loaded over HTTPS. Now, I took the screen grab a little while ago. I know they do have HTTPS now, which you can turn on for everyone, but I think you can still load the page over HTTP as well. Regardless, in this scenario, uh, they allowed the front page with the login form to be loaded over an unencrypted connection. Now, it's interesting because I sort of mentioned this and a bunch of people said, oh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about because it posts to HTTPS. It's okay. So it's encrypted, right? So when you actually submit the page, it is going to post it to an HTTPS address. And they're right insofar as when those credentials go across the network, they will be encrypted. So the scenario that I wanted to look at was one in Tunisia. So Tunisia is one of these corners of the world where they've had some issues. And a lot of people turn to social media to organize their uprisings and all of this sort of thing. Now, what was happening in Tunisia is people would make a request to load the Facebook page. And if you recall, this is over HTTP, right? So they're going, hey, Facebook, uh, give me HTTP column for the short search Facebook. And it comes back and it gives you a response over HTTP with the login page. Now, all of this is going backwards and forwards over these government-owned ISPs. So the government has well and truly got their hooks into all of the traffic that goes backwards and forwards. Now, we know that any traffic that goes over HTTP is plain text, and we know that any intermediatory that it goes over has the ability to read and manipulate that text. So what these guys are doing is they're going, OK, here's your login page, and we're just going to sneak this little bit in here. And what that little bit was, was when somebody logged back in and they posted to HTTPS, they'd have this little sort of parallel JavaScript thread which would send credentials to the government because they were simply able to put extra mechanisms and extra um, logic into that login page. So you think about it, you could easily put a piece of JavaScript in there that went off asynchronously and took form values and sent it somewhere else. So yes, the credentials were sent over HTTPS, but we had no assurance that the logon page hadn't been manipulated in transit. And that's where the real problem was. So there's a few different things that we can do with HTTPS. And firstly, there's, there's three really important things about HTTPS. So HTTPS gives us uh, confidence in the identity of the resource we're connecting to. Okay, so because that certificate has to be loaded up and because at least on a PC, it's a bit different with an iPhone or something like that, but on a PC you can inspect that certificate and you can say, well, is it you know, who I think it is and who I trust? You know who you're talking to. The other thing is, is that it gives you confidence that it hasn't been manipulated in transit, and that's what went wrong with Tunisia. So we had no confidence that it was uh, legitimate. And then the third thing is what we probably all associate HTTPS with, which is when I send information, it's encrypted and people can't eavesdrop on it and read it. So one thing that we can easily do, and again, with forms authentication, which leverages a membership provider, is we can set require SSL to true. Once we do that, the authentication token that forms authentication sets is flagged with secure. So forgetting about ASP.NET for a moment, cookies can have an attribute which says secure. Okay? And if you have a look at your cookies, particularly if you've got a little cookie inspector, you'll, you'll see that there. Once it's flagged secure, it will only be sent backwards and forwards by the browser if the connection is HTTPS. So setting this here gives you absolute confidence that people can't successfully authenticate if it's not HTTPS. 
So same thing with uh, your HTTP cookies. So wherever possible, try and set them to require SSL. But this again is one of those sort of things where there may be use cases where you don't want to do that. So maybe you've got a website where there is a legitimate use case that doesn't pose a security risk where you actually want to persist something in a cookie across both HTTP and HTTPS. Did everyone see Fireship a little while back? About 18 months back? So Fireship, <laughs> Fireship was kind of awesome. Um, it was a Firefox plugin that a bloke wrote seemingly because he got very frustrated with the likes of Facebook not taking security seriously and not using HTTPS. Now, basically what he did is he made this little plug-in where if you connected to a network and you were able to look at, say, wireless traffic, which a lot of network adapters can do on a lot of public networks, it would look for people that were logged into Facebook and they were sending an authentication token backwards and forwards over the clear. So when you use forms authentication you log in, the thing that persists your logged in state is this little authentication token. So you'll see if you look in your cookies, there's a cookie called .aspx auth. That is the keys to your session. So what this guy did is when he saw the equivalent of that for Facebook's PHP going backwards and forwards, he said, OK, I'm going to take that, I'm going to load that into my browser, and now I'm, I'm you. I don't have your password, but I've got your token, so I can go and impersonate you. So you got this, and I... Honestly, never actually used this myself, but I read all the news. You've got this little uh, panel down the side, and you can see the other people on this public network who are logged into Facebook. You click on them, you've got their cookie, you're now them. So you can do whatever you want. And this was a good catalyst for the likes of um, Hotmail, saying, OK, we're going to give you HTTPS everywhere. It was a good catalyst for Facebook to start offering HTTPS everywhere. But that's the sort of thing that happens when you don't actually have HTTPS beyond just the login. So it's not enough to just go, OK, I'm going to log in, I'm going to load my form over HTTPS, I'm going to post my data over HTTPS. The information that keeps you authenticated has to go over HTTPS, or you've got a big uh, fire sheep-like problem. So the first point here is obvious. Everyone knows that if you're posting sensitive data, like login details, or if you're loading sensitive data, like bank account details, you want to make sure that it goes over HTTPS. Redirecting from HTTP to HTTPS is an interesting one, and it's, it's interesting in that every time you do something in HTTP, you're vulnerable to, say, a man-in-the-middle attack, where you've got somebody that sits between you and the resource you're requesting, and they manipulate your packets. So an example of this, and it's, again, it's kind of one of these usability things. If you go into your browser and you type AmericanExpress.com, your browser will make an HTTP request to American Express. If you've got someone sitting in the middle, they could proxy that request they could get a response, they could send it back to you over HTTP, here's your login form over HTTP, you log in, they get your credentials and they proxy that request and you can actually sit in the middle uh, and do this. So the problem is, is that the whole session started out from HTTP, so the, the, the sort of very academic theory of how we should fix this is where every time you go to American Express or somewhere, type HTTPS into your browser and then you know you're establishing a secure connection to begin with the usability impact of saying I'm not going to allow HTTP at all is pretty bad because people go to their browser and they'll type AmericanExpress.com and it will come back and say, you know, it's, it's broken. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an interesting one. There are a couple of things in the pipeline that may change that, but for the moment it's a tricky one. A caveat to that may be if you have um, an internal application or something that's used by a controlled group of people and you can sort of say to these guys, look, the only way to access its resources you know, put in the, in the scheme, in the URL first, you can get away with it. Uh, and the final one, and many people are probably familiar this, with this one as well, don't mix the content on the page. Uh, so Bitly, the URL shortener, was doing this a little while ago. Qantas was doing it a little while ago. But you'd log in and you'd be all secure and you'd be sending your credentials over HTTPS and your URL would say HTTPS and then there'd be this great big freaking icon in there which says, hey, something's wrong because they've put one banner ad or something like that from HTTP. So it's your browser's way of saying, look, this says HTTPS, but not everything on this page has come over an HTTPS connection. Uh, so try and make sure that you don't mix it, otherwise your users start getting warnings and then you, they get desensitised and they ignore them and you, you have other problems. Last one here is unvalidated redirects and forwards. Uh, this is a, it's kind of a bit anticlimactic, in part because uh, many big players don't take it too seriously. 
So Google doesn't offer bug bounties if you find an unvalidated redirect and forward, or an open redirect, as they sometimes call it. And what it is, it's, it's a pretty simple sort of concept. So what happens with an unvalidated redirect? Let's take an app where we've got some external resources. And in this app, there's a requirement that we want to log somebody clicking through. So normally what you do is you say, OK, well, I'm going to put some sort of intermediary there. So this is going to go to redirect.aspx, which will do our logging, and then it will obviously redirect through to the external resource. So this is what should happen. I click on there and I go through to my website and I get my info. Now, we do a little bit of social engineering again and I tweet out and I say, hey, look at this, you know, it's really interesting and I have a URL and I can see it's got a redirect and that's it. Now, obviously it's not normally going to be localhost if you're trying to take advantage of someone, but, you know, maybe this is, uh, you know, again, Facebook or something like that. It's a domain that people trust and they're looking at this and they see this address and they go, okay, I trust that address and they click on it and suddenly they end up, okay, well, I've been, you know, this is the Bieber equivalent of being rickrolled. Um, <laughs> but I end up somewhere that I really don't want to be. And obviously it could be a whole lot worse than this as well, but this is a family event, I'm sure. So, um, so what's happening in this situation? Again, pretty self-explanatory. It's just taking whatever URL is in the query string and it's redirecting. You know, really, really simple. So a couple of things. Obviously the first thing is we now know that we should be validating that this is actually a URL. Uh, and of course, we should be output and coding it and doing all of that as well. But the other thing that we should really be doing is trying to say, well, what, what sites am I actually happy for my site to redirect with? How do I make sure that my site is not the launch pad to then go off and load malware or something like that? Because the risk is, and we'll take the Google example, if I've got a URL and it says google.com and then it's got a whole bunch of rubbish after the after the domain, because we've got query strings and all sorts of things in it. And I click on that and I load malware, I'm going to be going, hang on a minute, Google, I clicked on your page and now my computer's stuffed, you know, what happened? Um, so I, I think it really is the owner of the site's responsibility to try and fix that. Obviously the exception, and, and why I think Google doesn't take it too seriously, is that they've got, they're basically so big and they redirect into so many places and they've got some legitimate use cases for doing it, that they can't do something like this where they say, let's actually have a database of where we're allowed to redirect to. If you've got a fairly controlled site and you know exactly where people should be able to get to from your redirect page, you can create a whitelist. The other thing, and it, you know, again, we're sort of clutching at straws here because a lot of the time it's not taken too seriously, but uh, use an indirect reference map. So rather than putting the URL in the query string, uh, put it in a database somewhere and then put an ID in there. You know, make it something that's, that can't be manipulated. So like I said, that one was a little bit anticlimactic, which is probably why it's at number 10 and not any higher. Uh, a lot of folks don't take it seriously, but I think it's worth just having some little bit of due diligence in there. Okay, well the only things that I will leave you with, um, so all of those 10 are on my blog. There are essay worthy entries on each of those. Uh, there's about somewhere like 50,000 words worth of info on those top 10 that go into a lot of detail. It's also all wrapped up in a, in a free PDF. So if you want to just download the whole thing, there's 250 pages or something there, just take it and do whatever you want with it. Um, and there's a few other resources that might be useful, including all my code references which I'll tweet about or put on my blog. Um, and the very last thing I'll leave you with, which is the last point on there, there's a, an app which I built, a website I built called A Safer Web, which is the automated security analyzer for ASP.NET websites. Asaferweb.com, you go there, you put in a URL of a website and it goes through and it remotely does a lot of the checks that we looked at. So are your custom errors turned on properly? Uh, is your tracing turned off? Is your request validation on? Uh, so that's just sort of a little easy sanity check before one of your apps goes live as well. That's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Before you go, I've got a task for you. Go to tv.ssw.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll be informed of all upcoming videos. In addition, if you're super keen, I'm all about inspecting and adapting. So send me an email or send me a tweet at Adam Kogan. Cheers.